would do that and uh, take your Bibles, open to Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. We're taking a, a small break from the book of Romans, our usual study, and we're going to celebrate today the triumphant entry of our Lord, and of course, next week is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take that as invitations. It's a great time to invite someone, and uh, we do a little uh, something traditional just give you a little heads up for next week. We say, he is risen, and then everybody shouts, don't do it today, but next week, he is risen indeed, and just a celebration. And you know, the day of the resurrection is the most glorious day on the calendar. Amen. And it should be celebrated, and so we're excited to do that. But today, turn to Matthew 21. The title of our message is Allegiance to the King. If you want to follow along the sermon notes on your smartphone or tablet, you can do that, but you're going to need the church app. So just do an app search for Calvary Hillsboro, and you will have what you need. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for pursuing us. Lord, I pray that today we would be transformed, that you would truly take hold of our lives and glorify your name. We pray that in Jesus name above all names. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So we celebrate the triumphant entry of Christ in Palm Sunday because it is on this day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem as the champion, as the king of Israel. And here he's making it known openly. Up to this point, he has told people, you know, tell no one. But now it's an open declaration. He is the long-awaited Messiah. He is the King of Israel. He is the hope of the world. And it is coming in open celebration and declaration. A great crowd is coming together with Jesus as he enters into Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate. But you have to remember also that this crowd was looking for a hero. A conquering hero to throw off the oppressive boot of Rome. And who better than, than Jesus who has the authority and the power to raise a man from the dead. It was only just a few days before this that he raised Lazarus in an amazing display of power and authority. Roll the stone away, he said. Martha, who was with him, said, Lord, he stinketh. He's been in the, you know, four days in the tomb. Roll the stone away. I am the resurrection and the life. And he, you know, Lazarus came out. And it was a glorious thing, talked about through the whole region. Who better than Jesus to overthrow Rome? And who better than Jesus? Because he was the one who could confront and humiliate the Jewish leaders that everyone knew was corrupt. Jesus was the hero. But Jesus was about something far yet greater. Yes, there's a excitement. There's anticipation in the air. They could sense that something great was about to happen. But there was something far yet greater than they understood. Because Jesus came to do more than conquer Rome. Conquer Rome, it would fall on its own. The nature of humanity would cause it to crumble upon itself. But Jesus came to defeat an enemy far yet greater. The enemy of death. The enemy of judgment of our sin. And to win for us the salvation of life. To become the resurrection and the life. And to make a way for us to have relationship to the living God. He truly came as our champion and as our Lord. But he came as a king by allegiance. And this is really important for us to see. He's a king by allegiance. In other words, he's a king to those who choose to receive him as king. To open the doors of their heart. That the king of glory might come in. Because it's personal. He's a king whom you love. He's a king whom you give your heart to. Because he's defeated your enemy and he's won your heart. He's a king by allegiance. You believe in him. You place your life in his hands. You serve him by choice. He's a king by allegiance. One of the best uh, verses for this, actually, is Psalm 24 in verse 1. It's very personal when he says, Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, O you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. See, that's a picture of it personally. Because not only did Jesus come into Jerusalem as king and lord, he's presented as king of each individual heart. 
See, Jerusalem is a city. Of all the cities in the world, Jerusalem is the city where God has placed his name. And Jesus comes into that city as the king whom God has sent. But he's a king by allegiance. In a similar way, Jerusalem then is a picture of our hearts. He's placed his name on your life. He's made you in his image. He's claimed you for his own. Our response is to open the gates of our heart and welcome the king of glory into our lives because he's a king by allegiance. You know, we say the Pledge of Allegiance. You stand before the, you know, the flag and you put your hand on your heart. When you say the Pledge of Allegiance, you put your hand on your heart. And there's a reason for that. I pledge allegiance to the flag. And then you say, I pledge also to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Why do you put your hand on your heart? Because you're saying, I'm pledging from my heart. It's a matter of the heart. That's why I put my hand there. In a similar way then, see, we pledge allegiance to our king from our heart. It's a choice that we make. We say a pledge of allegiance. With God, it's the same thing. It's a matter of the heart. <clears throat> the story of the triumphant entry is a story about those who would receive him as king. But it's also a story of those who do not want him as their king. There are those, Scripture describes them, they resist the Holy Spirit. They kick against the goats. They stiffen their necks. They harden their hearts. Why? Because they do not want him as king. They want to be king of their own lives, master of their own destiny, captain of their own soul. Isn't that the mantra of the day, the age in which we're living? You can be master of your own destiny, captain of your own soul. Problem is, they don't have enough power to become the king of their own soul or master of their own destiny. When they stand before God, when they stand before the, the, the throne of the living God, they will not be able to say, I don't recognize the authority of this court. Everyone will recognize the authority of that court. Because the scripture says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, he's king, all right. He's king. He's king of glory. You know, today, the eastern gate in Jerusalem is blocked, mortared, shut. Why? Because Suleiman had heard the prophecy that the king would return. The Messiah would return. And when he returns, he will enter into Jerusalem through the eastern gate. So he had it blocked and mortared. You can see it's that way today. The Muslims then added a cemetery immediately in front of it, thinking that a holy man, the Messiah would be, would not come into the place of the dead. It's against the law of God to touch a dead body. And so they placed a cemetery there. This will surely thwart the prophecy of God. You know what's interesting? The scripture says, when he returns at the end of the age, he'll set foot on the Mount of Olives. The mountain will split in two before him and the way will be opened into the eastern gate. He will return as king and lord and savior. This is a story about God on the move. This is a story about God sending his son as king and lord. Some will receive him. Some will resist and harden how will you respond? It's personal. It's personal. God loves you. And his desire is that you receive him. Open the doors, open the gates of your heart and receive him because God sent him as your king. Let's read the story. Matthew chapter 21 beginning in verse 1. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to a small village by the name of Bethphage. Actually, it's interesting. The name has a meaning. Bethphage means house of figs, plays into the story. Now, perhaps it might be helpful if we can kind of imagine the scene. So let's say that the, the platform here would be Jerusalem. And as you go towards the east, you would kind of go down into the Kidron Valley. It's a, not deep. You go down into the Kidron Valley. There's a small brook there. As you cross over, immediately would be the Garden of Gethsemane. Many olive trees, etc., this is the place where Jesus and the disciples would go to 
When they left the city, they would go there. All during that week, which we call the Passion Week. Then you are sending up the Mount of Olives. From the Mount of Olives, you can oversee all the city of Jerusalem. On the other side of the Mount of Olives are some small villages, Bethany, Bethphage. And so it, Bethphage is the house of figs. When he came there to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says something to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now, this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. The prophecy was yet again fulfilled. Zechariah 9 is quoted. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. There are no coincidences here. All of these prophecies fulfilled have significance and meaning. The disciples went and they did just as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and laid on them their garments on which he sat. And most of the multitude spread their garments in the road. And others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. This is the procession of a king. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed after were crying out because this is a day of celebration. And they are crying out and shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now this has powerful significance, great significance. All through it, it does. Psalm 118 that we read earlier is quoted there. When he had entered into Jerusalem, all the city was stirred. Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now we're looking at more verses, but I want to start with these and understand. God is sending his son. He's sending his son to the city in which he had placed his name. And he expects a response. God expects a response. When he sends his king, he expects a response. You know, some have this idea, some have this concept that somehow God must be found. They have this idea in mind that they imagine scaling some great mountain, you know, to discover God. They must pursue, they must find him, scale some great mountain, or perhaps to meditate and empty their mind of all thoughts that they might become one with the great vastness. It reminds me... Uh, Many years ago, I was teaching this class, and uh, there were some question and answer uh, times, and there was a, a, a new believer who, he said, I have a question. Do Christians meditate in that way, similar to the Hindus and others, where they empty their minds? And I said, no, Christians do not meditate by emptying their minds. Christians meditate by filling their minds. They fill their minds with truth, they fill their minds with God's word, and they open their heart that the king of glory might come in. Here's the point. God is the one pursuing you. God is the one on the move. God is the one, in fact, the scripture tells us. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. It's a beautiful picture. God sent him to pursue you. It's a powerful picture because when someone's knocking on the door, you have to make a decision. What do you do? If someone comes to your door and it starts knocking on the door or maybe ringing the doorbell, you got to do something. Do you answer it or do you ignore it? By ignoring it, you are making a decision. Something must be done. Might be compared to someone, you know, calling out someone's name and they, they don't respond even though they can hear it. Have you ever pretended not to hear? I admit, I admit, uh, when uh, our kids were babies, and sometimes they would wake up in the night crying, I admit that there were times that I pretended not to hear them. <laughs> However, that's a completely different thing, because that is permissible. <laughs> but when the king of glory, when the king of the universe, when the creator of the universe is cr calling your name and knocking on the door of your heart, that's another thing altogether. That deserves a response. 
Jesus in Revelation 3.20 is the one who gave us this perspective. Behold, Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Beautiful, powerful picture. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem as the king of glory, the long-awaited Messiah. He's knocking on the door of Jerusalem, you might say. And that demands a response. He's sent by God. And the interesting thing is that they were actually told in advance. They were told in advance when the Messiah, when the King of Glory would appear. We were recently studying in our Wednesday service. We were in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, there is a very specific prophecy, very specific, by which they could determine the very day that the King of Glory would enter into Jerusalem. You know what's interesting? Jesus entered into Jerusalem that very day. They were told in advance. And they were told in advance that when your king, your Messiah appears, he will be witnessed to by amazing miracles. You will know him when you see him because the blind will receive their sight. The deaf will hear. The lame will walk. Demons will be cast out. Dead will be raised. You know, when John the Baptist was arrested and held in prison, at one point he sent messengers to Jesus with this question, are you the one or should we look for another? I love Jesus' response. It's so powerful. Luke chapter 7, verse 22, Jesus said to them, you go and you report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You go and tell John that, and he'll know the answer. In fact, just days before this, I mentioned it. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Powerful declaration. The whole, whole area of Judea was speaking of it. <clears throat> In fact, Jesus fulfilled more than three hundred prophecies. I mean, what is the statistical probability that one person could randomly fulfill 300 prophecies? It's astronomical. Statistical probability is so, uh, one out of 10 to the 9th or 11th. Or so. It's just hard to even get your mind around it. Maybe a way to illustrate it. Let's try to illustrate it this way. Imagine California is covered with nuts. Now, when you think about it, that's really not that hard to imagine. <laughs> California is covered three feet deep in nuts, and you take one of these nuts randomly and put a, an X on it and mix it in with the whole group. Then you take a squirrel and you throw it out of an airplane with a parachute. <laughs> no emails, please, on that. You throw this squirrel out of an airplane. He then randomly selects one Nut. The probability that he would pick the one nut with the X on it is like astronomical to consider. Jesus is sent by God with advance notice of the very day and the signs that accompanied him, the blind sea. Lazarus was raised from the dead. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? It's a powerful demonstration. And in fact, the resurrection of Jesus from the grave is a demonstration of the power and the authority of God. It says in the book of Acts, there is a day fixed in which God will judge the world. But he has provided evidence to every man by raising Jesus from the dead. There is this understanding he has sent him with his power and the signs and the prophecies that the king of glory might be recognized for who he is. But what does God do when they don't receive him? I think this is important to understand his heart. God grieves. God grieves when we don't respond. That's what happens. He grieves the multitude with Jesus. They're rejoicing. It's a party. They are celebrating. This is amazing. They're shouting out from Psalm 118, 
This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let's rejoice, man. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. That's the right response. You know, it's, uh, when you think about that verse, it's often misused and misquoted. I've, I've been around the church a long time. I remember when I was a, a youth, they taught us this really kind of a happy, fun song based on those verses. This is the day, this is the day. And whenever we'd wake up, you know, and it was a beautiful morning, kind of like today. Glorious, beautiful, wow, this is a great day. Let's, let's recognize that God made this day. Let's all sing the song. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And we're all like happy campers because it's a great song. But that's not what this verse is about. That verse is not about the weather. That verse is about the king of glory. That verse is about the day of salvation. This is a day of rejoicing. God sent his son. God sent his son to pay the penalty of sin on the cross. God sent his son that we might have resurrection and life. God sent his son that we might have a way of relationship with the living father. That's why God sent his son. That's the day. Let's rejoice in that. And that's the point. That's the right response. You know, Jewish music is traditionally written in a minor key. If you know music, you know that minor keys are sad. They're dark. So why do Jews write their songs dark, sad? They will openly tell you. We write songs in the sad key, the minor key, because our Messiah has not yet come. And when our Messiah does come, then we will change, and then we'll write music in the happy, rejoicing major keys. You know what's really sad? What's really sad is that their Messiah did come, and they did not recognize him at his coming. That is deeply sad, which is why, in fact, Jesus began to weep overlooking Jerusalem. There was laid out before him Jerusalem. And the scripture tells us that his weeping is a deep sobbing. And in Matthew 23, verses 37 to 38, we have his words. He's, as he is weeping, sobbing deeply, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. She who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Oh, how often I've wanted to gather your children together. The way a hen gathers the chicks under her wings. But you were unwilling. You wouldn't have it. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. And he's weeping. God's response? Grieves. Grieves. God sent his son. God sent his Son is king and champion to pour out his favor and blessing. But he grieves when we don't receive him. You know, in Jeremiah 29, 11, we have the heart of the Lord. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for good, for welfare, and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. That's God's heart. That's my plan. Receive my offer of life. He's the king and champion. He's come to knock on the door of your heart and offer to you everything that's in God's heart for you. How about Ezekiel 33, 11? Say to them this, say, As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. I take no pleasure in this. But rather, that the wicked would turn from his way and live. That gives me pleasure. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why would you then die, O house of Israel? You can imagine someone turning their back on God. What an amazing heart that God is offering. What an amazing opportunity for life. Someone turns their back, rejects it. You can just imagine God calling out to them, turn back, man, turn back. Why would you die? See, going back to Matthew 21, we got to see, we have to see the picture of here. Your king is a champion. This is a very important thing. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, it tells us, beginning in verse 12, it says, Jesus then entered into the temple and he cast out all those who were buying and selling in the temple 
And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house, in other words, this is my father's house, and my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Get out. Now, this is a dramatic scene. Very, very powerful. Very dramatic. Overturning a table is a dramatic thing to do. Do not do this at home. I mean, I literally mean, do not do this at home. It is a dramatic thing to do. Jesus sees these money changers, and they're taking advantage of people. Absolutely taking advantage of them. They're coming to, to, to offer God a, a sacrifice or a worship or an honor, and they have all this money changing, and they're just taking advantage of people. Jesus comes up to the table. You've got to remember, this is like solid wood table. Comes and takes hold of the table, and he throws it over. This is dramatic. Money flying everywhere. And then he's, you know, Scripture tells us in another place, he has a whip, and he's casting them out. Get out! This is dramatic. Very dramatic. Get out, this is my father's house. And you have made it a robber's den. Get out. It's a very dramatic scene. But there's great personal application because some things must be overturned. These people, these things were standing in the way of those who wanted to worship, those who wanted to honor God. You ask yourself, what, does, what, what makes God angry? It's that. Whatever stands in the way, those who honor God, want to honor Him, He's, he's a champion. He's got the authority, and He walks into the temple, and He says, this is my Father's house. Get out. Personal application, because the Scripture tells us we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He goes into Jerusalem, goes into the temple, starts overturning. But we're the temple. And when you receive him as king, when you open your hearts, he's going to go into that temple and he's going to start overturning some things. He's going to overturn what? The things which stand against God. He's going to overturn those things before they overturn you. He's for you. He's a king, he's a champion, and he's for you. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. He's placed his name on your life. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you receive him as king and champion, he's going to start overturning some things. But he's for you. He knows what's good for you. Maybe a way to understand it or picture it is in that relationship of parenting. One of the difficult things about being a parent, but one of the most important things about being a parent is being willing to overturn some things that are wrong. We, uh, you might know we raised five kids, three natural. We adopted two, now raising our, our granddaughter. And sometimes, you know, our children would make plans to hang out with certain friends that we thought were not very good influences, and so we would overturn. They get old enough to have their license, and they start driving, and they think that they could drive anywhere they want, anytime they want. Yeah, overturned. <laughs> you know, in Hebrews 12, verses 9 to 11, we see the very same thing. We had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Uh, shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us as for a short time, as seemed best to them. But He disciplines us for our good, so that we may share His holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. God knows what he's doing. And when he overturns something, he's doing it because it needs to be overturned. Because otherwise it will overturn you. My wife and I some years ago received a letter from one of our daughters. And that letter meant a lot to us. Because the letter said, thank you. Thank you for disciplining me. 
Thank you for saying no when you needed to say no. Thank you for holding the line when you needed to hold the line, and thank you for loving me. We love that letter. Interestingly, however, she sent that letter when she was in her 20s. She would not have sent that letter when she was 16, I can assure you. Because this is the very same one who I remember when she was 16, called me and said, Dad, Dad just want you to know, just want you to know, I'm going to be driving with a bunch of my friends from school, and we're going to be going to such and such a place to meet with such and such a people. I said, no, you're not. Dad, that's lame. No, we, we made our plans already. We're going to go to this thing. We're going to do it. I got all my friends. We're going to go to this. I said, no, you're not. Dad, that's lame. And now, actually, you see, you're arguing with me. So I'll tell you where you are going to drive. You're going to drive to my office, which is where I was. And then when you get to my office, you're going to walk into my office, and you're going to take those keys to that car, and you're going to put them in that hand right there. <laughs> Dad, I'm sorry. I'm glad that you are. Now drive to my office. <laughs> there are some things in life that God needs to overturn. But God wants our agreement not our resistance. When you give him your heart and you give allegiance, then you trust him. You trust him. God, I know that when you overturn, then it needs to be overturned. I, I don't like it, but I know it's needed. And I trust you because I also know that you heal what needs to be healed. See, this is what we see. Some things need to be healed. Immediately, the verse following, after it tells us that he cast out those who were buying and selling, overturning the tables of the money changers, he then, in verse 14, says, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Beautiful. Beautiful picture for us. Some people need things overturned. Other people need something healed, and God knows exactly what you need. This is important for us. Here's the Ezekiel 34, verses 15 to 16. We get the heart of the Lord here. I will feed my flock, and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I'll bring back the scattered. I'll bind up the broken, and I'll strengthen the sick. Some people have hardness. Some people have stubbornness. And God needs to overturn some things. Other people are hurting and empty and broken. And God will overturn nothing. God will heal, touch. God does both of those things. He'll overturn what needs to be overturned and he'll heal what needs to be healed. But see, all through these verses, you see his heart. And when he's your king and champion, you trust his heart. And that's what we see. You see in verse 12, he overthrew the things. Verse 14, he healed. But I love the story that comes next, verse 15. For when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done. Interesting phrase. You'd think that if they saw that they were wonderful things... They'd respond differently. But it tells us, seeing the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. How dirty you indignant of it. I love this scene right here because of these kids. I think God loves kids. I think, I think Jesus loves kids. And I, I get this. I imagine this scene, you know, because these kids, they, they were in the crowd, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, and the big multitude, you know, parents with their kids, and they're all shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They go into the temple, and Jesus over there, and he's healing. But then some of the kids, they see him in the temple, you know, they're through the temple, and, you know, like friends together. Hey, there he is, there he is, there he is. there's Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, hi, hi, it's us, we're over here. Hosanna, <laughs> Hosanna to the son of David. I love, I just picture Jesus looking up at them, like waving at them. Hi, kids. 
You can just mark it. There he is, there he is. Hosanna, Jesus, Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hi, kids. I just love this scene. Jesus casting out these get out of my house. Touching and healing. Hi, kids. You gotta see his heart. Because then you see they're indignant. And they confront Jesus, verse 16. Do you, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, yes, I hear what they're saying. And have you never read? Confronts them right back. I love this because these, these are like scholars, you know. They memorize large, vast sections of the Old Testament. And he says, yes, I hear what these children are saying. And have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you've prepared praise for yourself. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, lodged there. There's no fruit there. What is this? There's no fruit there. You're indignant over wonderful things. See, this is where it plays into the story. Verse 18. Now in the morning, when he returned to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing. No fruit at all. He found nothing on it except leaves. Leaves. Looks like there ought to be fruit. There's foliage. There's growth. There's leaves. There's no fruit at all. And he said to the tree, Then no longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Now seeing this, the disciples marveled and said, How did the tree wither? Is this important? I think it is. Fig tree. Bethphage, house of figs. Throughout the scripture, Jesus presents the idea, and in several other places where God presents the idea of fruit. Figs even, fruit. What was it that Adam and Eve sowed together to hide their nakedness when they sinned? Yeah, fig leaves. There's an important picture for us. I'm looking for fruit. God expects fruit in our lives. Several places in Scripture, Jesus spoke of it. Matthew 12, verse 35. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. The evil man, out of the evil treasure, he brings forth what's evil. Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. The point he's making for us is that you have a choice. How do you want to live your life? How do you want to live your life? You have a choice. Make the tree good. Uh, the good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, he brings forth what's good out of his life. Good things come from a good heart. I want you to be good. But see, when you receive him as king, champion. He begins the work of making you good. Let's overturn some things. Let's overturn some things. Let's heal some things. He makes us good. But there's an understanding here. He's a king by allegiance. Lord, I trust. I trust your heart for me. There's a choice to be made. In Joshua 24, verse 15, when Joshua, the leader of Israel, gathered the people together, he gave them a challenge. Choose. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we've made our decision. We've made our mind. We will serve the Lord. It's a choice to be made. How would you live your life? With honor? Good? Good fruit? Honor? Choose by making that declaration. Got to open the door that the King of Glory might come in. And you be king and you be champion. And you overturn what needs to be overturned. I trust you. And you heal what needs to be healed. I will trust you. Let's pray. Father, thank you 
Thank you for revealing your heart to us, showing us once again your heart to bless us, to transform us, that we might have the fruit of that which is godly and right and good. God, this morning, we come before you recognizing that you sent your son. You sent your son to pursue us. Church this morning, isn't that the whole point? It begins with opening your heart. It begins with recognizing that God sent him to pursue, to knock. The King of glory is standing at the door. It deserves a decision. Would you say, Lord, I want you to know I open the doors of my heart that the King of glory might come in. The King of the universe sent his Son. I receive him. Lord, Savior, King, Champion. But Lord, I want to say something. I want to say this. I want to say this. You come in and you overturn anything that needs to be overturned. I trust you. I trust you. And God, if you overturn it, that means it needs to be overturned. I take my hands off of it and say, God, then you just lay your hands on it and throw it over. Because I know this. I know that you will also touch what needs to be healed. I trust you. I trust you. And I ask that there be good. I want to be a good man. I want to be a good woman. I want there to be some honor in my life. I want to honor you. I pledge my allegiance to the King. I pledge my allegiance to the King. Church, is that your prayer? Is that what you would say to the Lord? Would you just raise your hand and say it? God, I want you to know it. Opening my heart. You're my King. You're my champion. I want you to know this. Overturn. What needs to be overturned? Just say it to the Lord. Is that risky? Oh, it's good. Overturn what needs to be overturned because I know you'll heal what needs to be healed. God, I trust your heart. I trust your heart. You're king and my champion. Would you just raise your hand and say that to the Lord? God bless. Father, thank you for everyone who is moved by the Spirit, who is touched by your word, who says yes. Oh, yes, God. Be my champion today. I honor you. I rejoice in this. I honor you as my King and Lord. In Jesus' name, and everyone said.